Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Vanessa Dunn Guyton, and I am the founder and executive director of Hush No More. Hush No More supports survivors when they're ready to come forward to get resources, to report to the police or anyone that they want to report to, or just to have somebody to listen to. We also provide training in our communities on what we call the Hush Topics, sexual assault, domestic violence, human trafficking, child sexual abuse, incest, all of those topics that families and friends have a hard time discussing and talking about in our communities, we talk about it. So I am so excited today because I have a panel of amazing experts and we're gonna talk about stalking. January is Stalking Awareness Month and it's something that happens to so many of us. It actually happens to one in six women and one in 17 men. That is a lot of people that this affects and sometimes you don't even know that you are a stalking victim or that somebody's stalking you or you don't even know what to do. So I have some amazing guests that I'm going to bring on that you can meet today and you'll be able to ask questions in the chat and just be able to communicate and learn something new that you can share with your family and friends or even for yourself. So let me bring them on. First, I'm going to bring up Debbie Riddle. Welcome, Debbie. Hi. And then I'm going to bring up Obi West. Welcome, Obi. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you. I'm excited. I'm bringing up Lenora Claire. Hi, it's an honor to be here, all the survivors and allies. It's good to meet <laughs> all of you. And then I have Danny Quartz. Hello, it's great to be here. And Anna Nassett. Welcome, welcome, Hello, welcome. This is an amazing panel. You are experts in your own way. Unfortunately, you're experts because of your own personal experiences. And so I wanted to make sure that I give you all enough time to share your story, to get people to understand that this can happen to anyone. And it doesn't matter about your race, your gender, your sexuality, your disability. It happens to everyone. And so it's important that we have a diverse panel that can share a story from a different perspective. So I believe that people can actually relate to all of us or definitely one person of their own life and see how they can see themselves. And so that is our goal today, is to be able to reach out and touch everybody and from a serious topic. And so I am excited to just get it started, right? So my first person that I wanna talk to and ask information from is Debbie. Debbie, can you tell us a little bit about you? Um, sure. I am a transplant living in North Carolina, grew up in Northeast Ohio, uh, mother of three girls, um, full-time graphic designer, but um, very much full-time activist um, and speaker on the topic of stalking. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about why you are a subject matter expert? What in your life happened that have you in this space today? Um, I come here today bringing expertise, unfortunately, um, through my youngest sister's story. Uh, my youngest sister, Peggy Clinky, was stalked relentlessly for a year um, under the watchful eye of our criminal justice system. Uh, the day Peggy left her abuser was the day she became a stalking victim. And in her stalking case, um, it started with text messaging and calls and following pretty much around the clock 24-7. Um, when Peggy was not engaging um, with this offender, um, he was getting upset because um, she was not maintaining any contact. So he decided to propose marriage. He jumped out of the bushes at her office and with a dozen red roses and a, at a wedding wing and said, I love you. Would you marry me? And Peggy walked right by him. Um, he was extremely upset, not because he lost the love of his life, but because he had lost the power and control over someone that he had been controlling for three years. Um, when Peggy would not engage with him, he made a flyer with Peggy's photo on it and wrote on it, I'm a bitch, I'm a whore. Um, I've had two abortions and counting. I'd love to sleep with you. Call me. And he put Peggy's cell phone number on it and distribute about 200 of them throughout the city of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, many of the places where he knew Peggy would find them. And sure enough, the next morning, she did find one taped to the door of her yoga studio. At this point, she went to the police with her phone records and the flyer and was told that there was nothing that they could do about it. It was just a piece of paper. 
Shortly after that, um, Peggy began dating someone else. Uh, Patrick began stalking this young man as well, um, calling him around the clock. We went to a wedding in Florida. Um, while we were all there, he uh, flew from Albuquerque to Ohio and wrote PK is a whore on my mother's garage door. We filed another police report. Uh, a few days after that, um, when Peggy and Mark were still in Florida, Patrick opened up a gas line and set fire to Mark's house. And this prompted Peggy to file um, stalking charges and to file for an order of protection. Um, at the same time, Patrick went in and filed for an order of protection against her. Um, he was very familiar with this. He had done this to his ex-wife. Um, she had filed several police reports in the city of Albuquerque. She was afraid for her life, afraid that he was going to kill her or kill their young daughter. Um, while Peggy was awaiting trial, she moved from Albuquerque to Turlock, California to hide um, until that trial was to happen. Uh, the trial was delayed several months, um, starting August into October and then into January. And over these several months, uh, Patrick was, to roam, was able to roam free. Um, he uh, posed as a police officer. He posed as a private investigator. He also worked as a private investigator. Um, inevitably, that private investigator that he was working with gave him a somewhat broad location of where Peggy might be. Um, and on January 18th, uh, Patrick encountered a UPS driver who gave him my sister's exact address. As Peggy was walking out of her condo, um, Patrick was hiding in the garage. He um, had a handgun on him. He beat her over the head with a handgun, um, split her head open. He put duct tape over her mouth, um, taped her wrists together behind her back, threw her up against her kitchen wall where she fell to the floor. Uh, Peggy was very lucky to be able to escape this situation. Um, she was able to run out of her front door um, into the arms of her neighbor, who was actually waiting to have coffee with Peggy that morning. They were able to go to Rachel's home and barricade themselves into in Rachel's house. Peggy was able to make a 911 call. Um, as the SWAT team arrived, Peggy begged the officer, please don't come in here. Um, if you open that door, he's going to kill me. And the police officer said, Peggy, look, let's, let's not talk about that at this point. And Peggy, in a very calm manner, said, um, I need you to get in touch with my mother in Ohio. Uh, tell her I love her. Um, I need you to tell my young niece, who's been sick all winter long, that she'll have a guardian angel watching over me. Um, and I need you to get a hold of my sister, who's pregnant, and tell her to name her baby after me. And shortly after that, Peggy was shot in the back of the head. And uh, Patrick turned the gun on himself and shot himself. Peggy died on her front lawn moments later. Um, when we learned this from law enforcement and talked to several people um, over the next few days, as we were planning Peggy's funeral, um, a part of me felt that my heart was healing as I was telling the story over and over again as to people were asking. And I knew at this point, um, I had the ability to make change. And I didn't know what that change was. Um, I had talked to Tracy Baum, who was the director at the Stalking Resource Center and, and want to change in law enforcement. Uh, they are the first responders with these victims. Um, could they get more training um, so people like Peggy uh, wouldn't continue to fall through the cracks of our criminal justice system? So in July of 2003, just a few short months after Peggy's death, um, Mark Sparks and I, um, who was Peggy's boyfriend at the time, traveled to Washington, D.C. for a congressional briefing. We were able to share um, Peggy's story and ask Congress to uh, name January National Stocking Awareness Month in honor of my sister, Peggy. Um, so here we are um, 19 years later, um, celebrating and honoring um, my sister. Uh, we've, we've come a long way, but um, we still have a, a, a lot of work to do. Thank you for sharing your story. I honor you in this moment because even though it's been 19 years, I'm pretty sure it still hurts the same. Like All the time. It's still, yeah, it's still hurtful for your family. And how did going to D.C. help you in like a healing process to get January to be named National Stalking Awareness Month? 
Um, you know, it, it was Patrick's purpose to silence my sister and going to Washington DC was um, bringing her voice to life. Uh, more people know Peggy now um, than they ever did in the past. And for me, that's that's where I keep her in my heart. Every time that I get to share this story with other people, um, my sister's right there with me. I love that. I honor her. I feel like her spirit is here every time that we do something and we save somebody's life, right? And we raise awareness and we talk about this issue. Her death doesn't go in vain. It really makes a difference. And I mean, I am really thankful that we can share her story on a larger platform. And I'm hoping that not only you, but everybody on this panel gets invited to different organizations to speak, to share your story so that we can let people know that this is real and how you can handle it and what you should do. So thank you, Debbie, um, for sharing that. Thank you so much. You are welcome. All right, Lenora. I have Lenora Claire. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, as you know, my name is Lenora Claire. I am a multi-violent crime survivor advocate, activist, entertainment industry professional. I'm on the board of the Los Angeles District Attorney Crime Victims Advisory Board, which is a really cool thing our new DA created where they chose nine advocates from around the city and I represent gender-based violence for all of LA. So that's quite an honor. And this year I also started a company where I sort of merge my worlds of working in entertainment and all the time I've been on these crime shows that use our stories to make sure that it's um, a positive experience for victims and survivors, that they're not treated poorly or manipulated by the media. So that's sort of my latest project. And I am an 11 year stalking survivor and I'll get into that story and try to tell it like the micro machines man. If you remember, I have to talk really fast because it's a lot, a lot has happened. Um, my story oddly began similarly to Anna who we're gonna get into, I, 2011, I opened up an art gallery. It was an amazing time in my life. I was getting a lot of press and media. It was really celebratory. And I say that to set the scene, not congratulate myself, but um, I was named one of the LA Weekly People of the Year, which was a real honor. That's my hometown. And I want to preface what I'm about to say that my stalker is very mentally ill, but I'm in no way saying that people who struggle with mental illness are in fact dangerous. So I think that's just an important statement to make. Um, but so 2011, I'm named LA Weekly People of the Year. It's like this beautiful article, beautiful portrait in the magazine. And my stalker, I'll just say his name, um, is a man named Justin Masler who had it legally changed to Cloud Star Chaser, which is sort of the first indication this individual is cut pretty out there. And he had been stalking Ivanka Trump. I remember this is 2011 out in New York. And I don't know this. I don't know the Trump. I don't know any of this. I'm living my life in LA. And he had actually multiple arrests for stalking Ivanka and he had attempted to kill himself in her store. So that kind of explains the level of, you know, danger and severity of this individual. So he, after an arrest with Ivanka, he jumps bail, comes to LA, opens up the magazine and to my misfortune becomes fixated on me. So he comes to my art gallery and he's wearing a spacesuit, which, you know, when you work in the arts, you're used to all kinds of eccentric characters. So I don't think much of it. And I engage him in conversation. So we're talking and I can immediately tell he's very intelligent, but really off. And he looks at me and he goes, you remind me of Jessica Rabbit. And I was like, okay, I get that sometimes, thanks. And then he's like, and Lilu from The Fifth Element, he's just kind of going on. And he looks me right in the eyes and I'll never forget it to this day. He looks me right in the eyes and he goes, and I'm going to stalk you. And I was like, oh, what? Like, it was just, it was such a strange statement to make. So I kind of kicked him out of the gallery. I didn't think much of it. He went peacefully at that point. And then a couple of days later, I'm getting all these text messages from my friends saying, girl, that guy you had the weird interaction with, he just got taken by bounty hunters, extradited to New York for the Trumps. It was like all over the news. And I was like, that's that's crazy. So he then goes to jail. He's in um, jail in New York and he starts writing these really like long rambling letters to my gallery. At first, they're not threats. They're just sort of like nonsensical rambling. So I'm like, OK you know, I'll just kind of document this and see where it goes. And then very quickly, it started to escalate to incredibly graphic rape and death threats, like beyond graphic. So that point in 2011, I go to LAPD with my like stack of rape and death threats with someone with a long criminal history, thinking they'll take me seriously, which was not my experience at all. I was victim shamed, victim blamed, told to dye my hair, to change my appearance, go off the internet, make myself lesser you know, anything to get this attention off of me. Like they offered no help, no assistance, no advice, nothing. 
So I was like, okay, I'm on my own here. So, you know, by that point, then it started to escalate into, you know, Twitter death threats. And I'm, I'm Jewish. So part of understanding my stalker is that he sort of vacillates between, he also has erotomania. So at some points he's in love with me. At other points, I'm the head of a Zionist conspiracy. He has to gas me through my door with Zyklon B, which is what killed my relatives in the Holocaust. And that's how we, right? So just really awful stuff. So at this point, I'm just living in my like little, I'm single, I'm living in my little dinky Hollywood apartment and I'm just terrified, right? So then the death threats, the rape threats keep coming. So I'm like, okay, I have to be vigilant. I start teaching myself like how to track IP because he comes from a wealthy family. So he's just bouncing around the country, stalking people and nobody's holding him accountable and nothing's happening. So I start to go, okay, you know, his IP is in this state. I'm at this level of danger today. And I sort of kind of regulating it in that way. So at this point, I decide I need to close my business of the art gallery because I can't be public facing anymore. I can't be in a place where this individual, as much as I love doing it and I was successful at it, and I really wanted to fight that, but I, I had to for my own safety. And that's when I started working in television. So I start working for the king of reality casting. And this is kind of important because a casting office, if you haven't been to it, has a revolving door, right? People are coming in and out all the time, but at least I'm not a single person by myself. So at that point, my stalker starts sending death threats to my boss and the whole office, you know, we're all afraid of workplace violence. They Google him. They see he's trying to kill himself in Ivanka's store. I end up not only losing my job because in TV, we just don't bring you back. You're freelance. And I'm just like, I've had enough of this. I work in TV. And that's when I first went public with my story in 2015. So I go public with my story. And that was a really pivotal point for me because I got connected with a woman named Rhonda Saunders, who some of you might know here in California. Um, with the, after the death of Rebecca Schaefer, she was instrumental in creating the first stalking laws, which I think she started trying to do in 89, but they got passed in 92. So the television show connected me with Rhonda, who became this amazing mentor. And very quickly, I got linked up with our local Congressman Schiff, who was like, this is before he was head of House Intelligence Committee. So I start working with him, creating proposals. I'm starting to realize there's all these gaps in the system, the law, the enforcement of the law. I started crea um, creating proposals that were given to DOJ. Um, so like, all this stuff is kind of happening, but again, nobody's helping me. <laughs> like my level of risk that I'm at currently, like nothing's going on. So I start just like doing the best I can and sort of like learning, you know, how to protect myself with tech and do risk minimization and just kind of getting really involved in that space. I start doing media because at this point I'm like, I'm going to get killed. Like no one's helping me. Like what do you, and I, I started to realize too, that like I was sitting on, this mountain of privilege, right? Because even though I was being like treated poorly, there's tons of populations who get it even worse than I do, right? So I was like, this is crazy. And I also started realizing that I started meeting survivors that I'm atypical and that I'm not intimate partner, right? And so it's very different for me emotionally. Like I can do media and to be like crazy man did a thing, right? So I started doing a lot of media. And at this point, um, they did a two hour, 48 hour special on my case, which was like viewed by 17 million people, which that's a whole other thing, because now I'm getting incels sending me death threats. I'm getting people sort of speculating as to why I'm going public. They're like, oh, look at you. You just want attention. Whereas here I am like, this is not the attention that I want. I'm trying to not get killed. So because of the TV that I was doing, my case got escalated here in Los Angeles. We have a department of the LAPD called the Threat Management Unit which is really kind of a messed up thing because it only exists for celebrities. And there are people who, they live in gated communities. They have resources. So I'm going, wait, wait a second, because I'm on TV, I get this thing and this is bullshit. Like, this is crazy. So that's when I started, you know, really doing very like boots on the ground work, working with other people. Again, the death threats are coming in, all of this stuff. And so as we're shooting my 48 hours, they interview my stalker without my consent, which is what eventually I believe was what triggered him to attempt to kidnap me. So 2017, Vice did an article on me. They called me the Aaron Brockovich of stalking, which went viral. So then at this point, and literally every day since 2017, individuals have come to me for some level of assistance. I've done over 100 restraining orders for people. That's I stopped counting after 100. I'm like, it's not a frozen yoga punch card, but I just started getting really involved. But again, nobody's helping me, but I'm going, okay, at least I can sort of, the things I figured out, I can help give to other people. So after the 48 hours happened, um, my stalker is in LA. He's very actively like stalking me. And so I get this call and it's like, it's still, it's so jarring and weird. Um, my, my stalker got put for the first time in jail, like briefly, right? So I'm getting a little bit of recourse and reprieve from the daily death and rape threats. And then I get this call, I'll never forget it. Um, 
Trump had just won. So I was very sad. I'm walking my dog on my front. I feel like I can say that in this group because if we're here for crimes that um, that that help uh, women, obviously, I'm just going to bring a roll with the fact there's no Trump supporters here. Um, so I get this call and I'll never forget it. It was Secret Service and LAPD. I thought it was a prank. I literally said, OK, who the hell is like, who is this? They're like, no, this is Secret Service. Your stalker has this because he was in a psych ward. He had escaped the psych ward. He was on the loose. And they're like, now your case has escalated because you share a stalker with Ivanka Trump, who's now the president's daughter. So I literally said to myself, wow, I'm the one person who's going to benefit from this Trump presidency. I've won the stalking lottery. Some, something's going to happen now. They're going to have to do something. And that's not what happened. So he gets caught in New York because as much as he was stalking me, Ivanka is now the first daughter, very attractive to him, right? So he goes to New York where he's not even allowed to be in the state. He gets picked up a block away from Trump Tower. So now I'm thinking, okay, he's really going to get some time. New York has such terrible laws. He was out, I think, in six weeks. He comes to L.A. with the specific purpose of killing, raping, kidnapping, all of that. So um, I, you know, it's one of the things where people, you can't just block them, right? Blocking is for harassment. It's not when you're being stalked. You're gathering evidence. So it's a really good thing I didn't listen to my peers who didn't really, well-intentioned, but didn't know what they were talking about. And so my stalker wrote me and said, I know you go to L.A. Comic Con. I'm going to go there and I'm going to kidnap you. Right. So he didn't know this, but I'm actually friends with some of the owners of L.A. Comic Con. So because I wasn't getting help from LAPD, I set up an operation with them, which because my case is so wild, um, we hired. I didn't want to scare the kids. Extra security dressed as Batman and Superman. Right. So when he came to kidnap me, they held him down. Also, just like another weird side note, um, my stalker was also stalking the Kardashians and I was working with their ex Mossad security team. I thought for sure nobody's scarier than ex Mossad. They're going to catch them. That's not what happened. My stalker came, tried to kidnap me, Batman, Superman, hold him down, bring him in, turn him into LAPD. The Kardashians then served the restraining order. <sighs> Gwyneth Paltrow, who I didn't even know was in the mix, she served her restraining order. There was some incident with the children. A year later, we have a trial. You know, this is like a, he was on a million dollars bail. And I'm, I prepare my victim impact statement. I am so ready for this. I get there and my DA is like, okay, we're going to do a plea, felony stalking max. And I'm like, what? And I, I, I really was pretty pressured into that. Um, I was told that I, I shouldn't even give my victim impact statement because I, was, I couldn't compel a judge for more time because they were really going to go for this felony max. So I was just kind of like, okay. And then California, we had a proposition. It's important to explain explain called 57, which a couple of, when it was put out, I think it was 2016, it sounded great, right? 57 was nonviolent offenders reduce sentencing. That's awesome. Like, I don't want people who are nonviolent offenders to be in jail. However, in California, we call crimes stalking, uh, rape of an unconscious person, forced sodomy and human trafficking are all considered nonviolent, which is, that's a, a horror onto itself. So because of that, even though I got the max, four years felony stalking, served two, he got out December of 2019, and within three days of stalking me again, I put him in jail five times. I have an ankle monitor on him. I'm trying to come up with a program here for the LADA, which is sort of using geofencing where you could use a, an app that's a tracker. So I would know if he was in proximity to me because I don't know if you all know this, but with the ankle monitors, they only check once a week. doesn't really do a whole lot for you. So anyway, that's there's a lot more to my story, but I want to hear everybody else. I feel like that kind of brings us up to speed. But my case is ongoing. I hate when people say, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And I'm just like, it's not past tense. There is nothing past tense about my story. Like, yes, I've come to a place where, you know, people see me on the shows. And it's because there's not that many living survivors who are comfortable telling their stories. Right. And so people think, oh, you must be in a great place. And I'm like, no. And, and we, we sort of said this before we started, you know, we have to be twice as loud for those who can't. Right. And because I work in media, I have those connections and I can do that thing. But nothing about my case is resolved. I'm not any safer than I was. I just had breaks or he's in jail. But I use my knowledge to help other people. And I feel that it's been effective and, you know, doing my best to work on legislation and everything with a very flawed system. So that's why it's important that we all connect in this and we can all work together. It is. And I honor you in this moment, Lenora, for sharing your story, for coming forward, for being a voice for those who can't. Right. Yeah. And what you did for me is to put face on that. Being, this happens to celebrities, too. It doesn't matter if you're rich, if you're famous, if you're poor. Mm -hmm. It happens all across the spectrum. And I think it's important that people know that and understand that. Do you feel safe today? 
I mean, I'm, I'm safe because I do as much as possible, right? I sort of call it, it's like a condom, you know? It's like you've reduced your risk, you've done the right thing, oh but things God. happen, like, you know what I mean? So I'm never fully safe. I'm always, I, I carry with me the, the, the long form anxiety and the PTSD, but I've done as much as I possibly can do. So I want to live as much life as I can, but no, I'm never fully safe. I've just gotten to a place with it where it's as manageable as possible. Yeah. You said that other people file orders on him. Do they have a case against him? So does oh, everyone have a case or are you just like, like the only 40 one? people that I know of? And actually at some point we'll probably have a federal trial where we all come together. But yeah, there's like at least 40 people. There's 40 restraining orders that I know of. But again, the, the system is pretty flawed and it's very revolving door. So sure he goes in, but then they just, I mean, even with me, I put him in five times. So yeah. Well, I'm hoping that we make enough noise that they see how important this is and how it really destroys lives. I want to say that all of you are very resilient. I don't look at you as just being strong. People say, oh, you're strong. We're not necessarily strong, right? We're resilient. We bounce back. You know, we come back doing it better the next time and learning from things that we've done in our past and different situations. And so I do look at all of you as being resilient and thank you for sharing. Thanks. Next, we have Obi West. Tell us a little bit about you, Obi. Hey, my name is Obi West. I'm a writer and a spoken word artist, and I'm an uh, advocate against uh, abuse reduction or for abuse reduction. So in a, uh, in a nutshell, that's who I am. I'm going to approach this a little bit differently. I think we all know from the first two stories that this is absolutely prevalent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go a, a brief overview of what I went through, but I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the problems I had when I tried to combat this thing the kickback that I got from wherever the kickback came from. So just to give you a, uh, in a nutshell, what happened, there was a, there was a woman who I had a volunteer interaction with at some point, I had a business, I was selling t-shirts. She bought a t-shirt interaction started from there. And then after that, I started to notice things that was very uncomfortable. I started to notice that she would target people who, who I appeared to be close with. And then she would try to get close to those people. So after a while I, I broke contact or tried I was in the military and when I met her, I was in Oklahoma. They sent me to Korea for two years. That two years, just by default, there was no contact. And then when I got back, um, I started to hear from her again. And I'm naive, giving her the benefit of the doubt. Okay, there's nothing wrong with me being cordial. Never met up with her, just spoke over the phone and things of that nature. And then the conversations, the, the contact started to get more frequent. She started to contact me more frequently. She would uh, see people post flyers online. She would go target the person in charge of the flyer and get to know that person. And then eventually go tell that person fabricated stories about me. I would start hearing from people saying, hey, I wanted to hire you for such and such speaking engagement. But I got contact from this lady and she was telling me stuff and I didn't want no parts of that. So I never contacted you. So I figured out I was missing out on business. There was people who was fed up with talking to her. So they told her, listen, don't call me no more. They would block her number. And then she would call them from my number. She would call their phone. My number and name would pop up on their caller ID. And when they pick up, it would be her. So she figured out a way to call people from my number. And it was all types of things. I would have shows in certain states that she didn't live in, in Texas. I think she lived in Detroit. She showed up at the show. I had a show in Mississippi. She lived in another state. She showed up at the show. So, and I was thinking, okay, public show, anybody can come. But these are things where she had to go through extreme planning and logistics in order to be there. So these are things that would happen. And then um, I live in Las Vegas. And then at some point she moved two blocks from me in Las Vegas, from another state, came to Las Vegas, was living down the street from me. Um, when I finally cut all contact and blocked her from everything, she showed up at my door at midnight. So in a nutshell, just to tell you the extent of what was going on, that, that, that was... The situation. Now I'll tell you the problems I ran into. The first problem is I didn't know I was being stopped, stalked. So we talk about um, there's a small group. When we were talking about this prior to being live, collectively between myself, Debbie, Lenore, we're talking about how small this group is. I think a lot of the reason why this group of people who have been stalked is small because a lot of people don't recognize stalking. So it's happening to them and they don't know it's happening. So Anna, who's here on the, on the, um, on the show, we were holding general conversation and I'm telling her some things I'm dealing with and she had to tell me I was being stalked. So the first problem I had is I was ignorant to what was happening to me. So after I learned what stalking was, I would try to uh, I tried to combat it. Then I tried to go and get no contact orders. But what I learned was when she would contact me and I would talk back and say, listen, don't contact me, blah, blah, blah. That was voluntary interaction. And that discredited my claim. They said, well, you're speaking back. 
So now it's not stalking. So now I had to pretty much block her from everything except one thing. I had to keep one line of communication open because I needed that in order for me to build a case. So this line of communication is open. I'm getting this, this conversation as one way. I'm not responding. And I have to let that go on for a month so I can build my own case. So then after I built my own case, I turned the case in to Nevada and I had to fill out an application for stalking. One of the questions they asked me, they said, how do you know the person? And they said, is it a blood relative? Is it a old acquaintance? And I put old acquaintance. So they kicked it back and said, this is not for us. This needs to go to family court because it's domestic. So we're not in a relationship. They say anybody that at any point you volunteered interaction with, it's called domestic. So then I had to go to domestic court. So I had to start all over with the domestic court. So now with the domestic court, the stalking application didn't apply anymore. Now I had to fill out a domestic application and only did they take heed to it if there was violence involved. Because there was no violence involved, they were reluctant to do anything for me. So now I'm in a situation where I'm forced to deal with whatever's happening because there's no violence involved. So they're waiting for something to happen, like what happened to Debbie's sister, in order for this thing to become important. Um, there's no preventive. Everything was reactionary. And it was very, very disturbing. And being that I'm a man and she's a woman, I felt like if anything happened, I defended myself against it. It wouldn't be defense. It'll be assault because of my gender. So now I'm running into all these problems. So I had to keep pushing buttons. And so they finally decided to do something about it. So then they issued, well, first, during the court proceeding, the lady asked me, why didn't you just block her from everything? This is the, 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 the judge. Why didn't you block her from everything? I said, well, the paperwork that I turned in in order for you to even pay attention to this was evidence that she's been contacting me. If I blocked her from everything, I wouldn't have this evidence. So now it was held against me from not just blocking her from everything. But the fear that we run into as people who are dealing with this is when I did block her from everything, she went to the next extreme and showed up in my house. So blocking a person doesn't make them stop. It just makes them go to the next level of extreme. So it forces you to feel like I have to accept this level of extreme in order to avoid this one. So I didn't block her from one way, blocked her from every way that she can contact me except one because I wanted to develop this log. So I used the log and they give me a 30 day protection order. It expired in 30 days. And then I went back to court and they extended it for another 30 days. And then it expired. Then a the problem I ran into is after your protection order expires, you have no protection. And the person's not going to stop. And just recently, I put something online because I had to cancel some events saying that I was sick from COVID. I get an email from her instantly. She's giving me remedies of, of how to combat COVID. My birthday was last month. I get a phone call from a restricted number. I pick it up and it's her happy birthday. And then she gets off the phone. Nothing that I've ever said about her would let her should make her feel like I want her to contact me. But with these stalkers, they don't act based off how you feel about them. They act based off how they feel about you. And you're just forced to accept it. So these are a lot of things that I went through. I have 28 seconds before I have to stop talking. So um, how it currently affects me now, I'll go through this real quick. Um, she's omnipresent, even if I don't see her. The flyer for this, I never shared this flyer because um, I can't even promise you that she's not listening to this right now. There's people who I'm in a group with that she potentially follow those individuals. So I didn't share this flyer because I didn't want to trigger her to start acting again. Like Lenora said, she felt like when they interviewed her stalker, that triggered him to now want to kidnap her. And for me talking about that's my alarm. So I need to shut up. So when it's when it, when she when I'm talking about right now, the long lasting effects, this can serve as a level of satisfaction to the person who's stalking you and now make them want to ramp up and start doing what they're doing again. So I'm not even positive that right now I'm not talking to you and talking to her as well. So there's there's, there's a lot more to this, but there's just more people on this line and a respect for time. Um, that's just pretty much what I went through and what I'm still going through. So. Um, Vanessa, I'll hand this back to you. All right. So for you, being a man, did you ever feel like there was some shame associated with it? How did you feel being a man that a woman was doing this and how people would kind of view you? Did you ever consider that? No, not me personally. I didn't feel no shame. I'm a, I'm a, I mean, I'm a spoken word artist, so I spend my life pretty much telling my business. So I, I didn't feel any shame. But I would guarantee if there was 10 men that this was going through, nine of them would probably suppress this out of a level of shame. So I think I'm the anomaly. I can't speak for the majority. I think this is something that's really tucked in men's pockets because of how it may look. There's a woman chasing you around. You're not happy about that? I wish I was being chased by a woman, right? That's the common response that you'll get from other people. So um, I'm not shamed, but I would, I would bet that a many are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we have a stat of one in 17 men, that men are really dealing with this, 
And mm -hmm. I wanted to know, is it something that you would say to another male that was going through something similar? Because you think that, oh, she just likes me. You just kind of blow it off. Like you said, you didn't you realize you were being stopped. Is mm -hmm. it something that you would say to a male that's going through this? I would say anything that you wouldn't be allowed to do to another person, don't make yourself subject to that treatment because of your gender. So if at any point you feel like someone is invading your space, regardless to what their gender is, you absolutely have a right to raise your hand and say some help sources are built based on problems that exist. So if we have a problem that exists and we're not raising our hands to acknowledge it exists, there's never going to be any help sources. So if you're a man and you're remaining quiet, you're paving the way for us to never get help for this thing. So at minimal, just keep screaming about it. And then at some point they'll say, OK, maybe this is a problem and then help sources become more prevalent. So thank you, Obi. I honor you in this moment for sharing your story. It's not always easy to just be so transparent. For you as a poet, it is because you share a lot of stories about yourself, but it's still something personal. And I think that when you all come forward and share, that gives other people courage and to know that they're not alone. So thank you for just being in this place with me today. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So next I have Danny Quartz. Welcome, Danny. Tell us a little bit about you. Hi, everybody. So a little bit about me, uh, my story, just to give some context. So I'm a conversion therapy survivor. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's where you go to a therapy or a camp uh, and, and try to pray the gay away. It didn't work. Still queer as Christmas. Nice to meet you. Uh, but that's a big part of my story. So 10 years ago today, I was still a high school dropout, a musical theater performer trying to make it big and, and go that route and met my ex-husband. Um, and 10 years later, I'm no longer that person. I have a degree, career, degrees, career, uh, and a different life. Uh, but unfortunately, that path, of course, attracted a stalker. So my story, <laughs> if I should just kick off into my story. You sure can. You can. Uh, all right. I was all into your introduction. You had me in the introduction, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> So share your story with us. Sure, you betcha. So as I mentioned, I, I met my ex-husband about 10 years ago. So I'm coming out of conversion therapy, right, into this space, uh, still a high school dropout in the, the process of this 10-year relationship with my partner, musical theater. He was a cellist. I was a singer in a production. We, um, in the process of this marriage, we met a music director who became a very close friend. We were friends for 14 years. We always knew that that he liked to push boundaries but I'm from the Pacific Northwest and we are very nice people. I wouldn't say we're kind people. I would say we're nice people. Sometimes we can be a little too passive and want to make space for everybody at the sacrifice of our own boundaries. Well, when my relationship with my ex-husband ended, uh, my stalker took it upon himself to what he would tell later in court, level the playing field. And he started stalking me uh, in, in cyber stalking. What I want to do here, given the stories that have already been shared, I want to share some statistics that are related to my case. So my stalker went to prison with a felony in 2018. He's one of 16 cases out of 16,974 reported to the DOJ. Let me repeat, 16 that were resourced that year. 16 out of 16,974 in 2018 that got resourced. Uh, the police, I don't think, have ever taken a police report for me, and I'll back up to that again as well. The commissioner that was supposed to handle my uh, restraining order case hit on me before and after the case on Scruff, a dating app, and refused to recuse himself until the last minute. And the substitute commissioner in this district read my address aloud in front of my stalker three times after I had moved. My image was hijacked, my number was hijacked, and there was absolutely nothing I could do. Did you know you don't own your image until you get it copywritten? I did not. <laughs> you do not own your image until you get it copywritten. So if it's revenge porn, or in my case on Grinder Scruff or Craigslist with my address and phone number, there's nothing you can do to take it off unless the people on the other end of that line are willing to work with you because of their values as an organization. And that was not universal. So my case, started out again, as I said, it started with a divorce. Uh, I thought it was tied to my divorce, uh, to tied to my ex-husband and his new partner. Uh, 
um, from that divorce at the time. It wasn't. It was actually somebody, it was a third party, it was this other person who actually continued to be my friend during these stalking incidences. It would start out as small things like a robo dialers, perfectly legal. I get about 840 to 1200 in an evening, which would shut down my phone. Okay, so people say, as you've heard it here, turn off your phone, lock the number. Here's the thing. Not only did I change my number and they followed me through, but you can change the digit one number each time. So when you do turn off your phone and then turn it back on again, it's going to take hours to process those incidences. Imagine what that does to your psyche. So I did lose a job. I moved away, changed my number three times, changed my devices, got really good at cybersecurity, and it still followed me. My stalker tracked my location and targeted communications to me directly based on who I was speaking to with text. He also would take my number, hijack it, and send threats to my friends, to his colleagues. My stalker was one of the leaders at an IT firm in Seattle, or a law firm. He was the leader in IT for a law firm, a major law firm in Seattle. We'd also use their equipment to stalk me, people at the law firm, and my friends. What really bugs me about my case is that it took two years, which is not a long time in the grand scheme of things, to get resource, but it also took $75,000. I'm going to share that because that's privilege. I have privilege to fund my justice. I'm not going to see a cent of that back. Probably. I got restitution. Have I seen anything? No. Is he working? Yes. Is the system set up to help me? No. $75,000 is what it costs. And an attorney out of New York City, I'm in Seattle, other coast, to help guide him. The DOJ rejected my case twice. Again, no police reports. The death threats I would receive are, are you ready to die? To which the police in Seattle, a tech hub, would reply, well, that's not really a death threat. That's a question. Then I would say, okay, well, great. Well, I got the IP address of this email because I know how to track that. And it points back to this general neighborhood. That's where my ex-husband is. That's where I think the stalking is coming from. Can you investigate this? No, we can't. I'm so sorry. Can you take a report? You know, Judge Judy loves to say, if there's no report, it didn't happen. I didn't get one. Guess it didn't happen, right? It did go to federal court. They did an investigation. They found it later. What really also bugs me is that after I moved about 60 miles to the south to isolate, to hide, things would just get worse. Now, conversion therapy was banned in 2018, around the same time that all this came to a head. And as I found success, as I was in USA Today, as I was in legal or uh, local uh, sources here around town, the stalking would increase. As I was coming home from helping out uh, some uh, scholars here in Seattle, I was getting in the moment death threats that said, I'm waiting in your closet. Can't wait to see you. Can't wait to see how much you bead. Ready to die and I can't wait to rip out your intestines. I called 911, they didn't know what to do. I called the local police uh, down where I was living and they said, come wait, don't go inside, wait in the parking lot. An hour of waiting in a dark parking lot where my soccer probably knew where I was, a police officer came. In the course of our interaction, he mocked me. He related this death threat. And by the way, I had a timeline of all my evidence, which is a great way to stay safe looked at it, said, oh yeah, my friend signed me up for spam stuff all the time. I got signed up for a senior citizen mailer list once, mocked me and sent me home alone, denied a police report. I called the police chief the next day and then followed up in an email, I have this in writing, who said, there's no record of you ever talking to this officer and he's a good man with a family. Hmm, just gonna let that sink in. So that's my case, right? Now, I also had sexual misconduct allegations. I was active in the media. Again, conversion therapy was just banned for minors in Washington state. I was a big part of that. That's a great celebration, but unfortunately my stalker tried to silence my voice in that moment by hacking an Associated Press reporter's email to say that I was sexually molesting the foster children I volunteer with every summer. Luckily for me, in addition, despite this being a very well-crafted email that he did a lot of research for, I was not at camp the year that he made those allegations and they were quickly turned away, but they were still lodged. That did not get the DOJ to resource my case, despite the investment I made in an attorney. It was only after 
my stalker, Joel, used my telephone number to stalk the receptionist at his legal firm and a Seattle detective was investigating me because I was tied to that number and I was able to hand over my timeline to her. And the law firm said, oh shit, this is the head of our IT department that the DOJ took up the case, resourced it, and he went to prison for two and a half years with a felony. And that is my story. Thank you, Danny. Um, I honor you in this moment because it's hard. It's hard to come forward to share what's going on. Like I said about Obi being a man, right? And it's it's not always easy to just say that this is happening to me and then by another man. And so there's so many stigmas associated with it. People have so many opinions that really get on my nerve. I'm just going to tell you, right? I, I don't like that at all. <laughs> and so I really am proud of you for coming forward and just being able to share because there's so many people that can identify you. When I look at the stats, lesbian women, one in five, are stopped. And then men, men, right? One in nine. So those numbers are high. You're higher if the rates are higher for you to be stopped if you identify, right, as gay or lesbian or other than heterosexual. And so it's important that we talk about this and don't be silent about this and protect people no matter what their sexuality is, no matter what their orientation is. That is so important. And I honor you for standing up and speaking up for those that are silent and can't speak for themselves. I think that's important. So now, where are you as it relates to like, do you, are you still fearful? Or do you think that things are going to still happen to you? So my stalker got out of prison. Um, and it, I was under the understanding that he was not supposed to be using internet without the supervision of the DOJ. But I think we all know that we can't really rely on that. Because he's actively on YouTube posting. And every time I send it in, they're like, ah, it's just YouTube. Come on. But he's making, he's not in this state. He lives uh, in a different state with his parents. And yet he's posting in my community on the uh, community blogs that we have to just, I'm sure, to let us know that he's watching. Mm -hmm. We know that he's doing theater still. We shouldn't know that information. I still have a restraining order against him. And yet he's dropping little breadcrumbs to let us know he's still there. I'm starting to get texts as well similar to what I received in the beginning. And there's not really much you can do about that at this time. Um, so he's out there, you know, kind of like OB mentioned, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if he's watching as well. And if you're coming for me, go for it. You'll go back to prison. <laughs> Cause you are not scared. And that's what I, I love about all of you. You're not fearful you're coming for it and you're standing up for yourself because all they are just bullies they're just bullies right and I, that's how i look at them and one thing people think is that when you are stalker that you're not necessarily smart all of you have had very smart and creative stalkers right they're not dumb by the least bit you know they might have a little bit of mental illness going on but that's not an excuse they're very creative in how they do this and they're manipulative right? They're charismatic. You would never think that they would ever do this. And I think that's important for people to be able to realize that, that they are there and they're doing some mean and evil things, you know, and they're smart. So thank you for sharing that. Thanks for the space. Uh, yeah. All right. I have Anna Nassid. Welcome, Anna. Tell us Hello. a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for all being here today. So I'm Anna Nassid. And I'm joining you from Vermont, uh, where I have a business called Stand Up Resources. And I provide training to military advocates, law enforcement, college campuses, communities on topics of stalking is my field of expertise, and um, other sub subjects of sexual violence as well. And along with that, I do graphic and web design for victim service agencies. So that's where I'm coming from today. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you do. And so your work stem from your story as well. So can you give us some background of what actually happened to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as Lenore mentioned, we have very similar stories and have really connected over the years. Um, but mine has a very different result. So I'm going to try and focus today on when things actually go right in a stalking case. Um, so I'm also a survivor of multiple forms of sexual violence. But in 2011, I too owned an art gallery. And one evening, a man who I didn't know would approach me with the gift of a painting. Didn't seem like a big deal. Thanked him very much. 
He said he wanted to show art at my gallery, um, which was very typical. And so I gave him my business card, sent him on his way, locked the doors, went home. Immediately, he would start to email me with his um, artwork, and I politely declined showing his artwork and thought nothing of it. But I started to notice that he was calling the gallery. Um, he started to send me Facebook messages. Like, we weren't friends, but he started to send me all these messages, commenting on my appearance, telling me he was, he'd was he seen me different places, you know, saying it was nice to see you today. I'm like, I, I never saw you anywhere. So I immediately started to be like, there's something a little strange here. and you know, told my friends, told the guy I was dating the time. They're like, oh, psh, it's not a big deal. Just ignore him, whatever. But he kept, you know, writing me these strange messages and just, you know, I just felt really like something was wrong here. Um, so eventually I would call a friend of mine who kind of knew everyone in the community. And for the sake of the story, I'm going to use his name of Jeffrey. I don't like to say his real name. So I called up my buddy and I was like, have you ever heard of this guy, Jeffrey? And he's like, you need to go to the cops right now. It's like, what? No, I don't. Um, but I followed my friend's advice and I went to the police and was met with really incredible empathy and kindness. Um, I was living in a small town in Washington, so, you know, small law enforcement, but I was met with a lot of empathy and they basically told me like, this man does have, um, a mental health situation and he's been known to stalk people for short spurts of time in the past. And they really just kind of told me, like, you know, we need you to collect your evidence. We need you to, you know, document everything, try changing your routines. Immediately, everything that had to be done by me, because if you are a victim of stalking, you don't have someone to investigate with you all the time. You are the investigator. You are your detective. You are your security. So I just started to document everything. And this went on for a couple of months. And then amazingly, in 2012, uh, the prosecutor of town actually prosecuted him. And he would end up pleading down to misdemeanor harassment of stalking me. Um, and he would serve a year in the county jail. And during that time, I thought, great, like, I showed him. He's never going to mess with me. Like, I did it. Like, I'm safe now. Um, you know, I had my protection order and everything else. But he would get out of jail. And he didn't initially start contacting me. It was more that he likes to write a lot of letters. So he was writing letters about me. Um, similar to Lenora's case, we think that he has erotomania as well. And so he would write these letters describing very graphically the sexual relationship that he and I had in his mind. And then go into all the ways in which I would, should die. And one of the things, like especially with all of these specific ways of which I should die, the police couldn't arrest him on that. Because he didn't say he was going to kill me by those ways. He said she should die by these ways. Um, so they showed me that letter that when that first started happening, I was like, please never show these to me again. I don't need to see these. Um, he still writes them to this day. He sends them for the last you know, 10 years. He's been sending them to my friend who told me to go to the police station. He's been sending them to the prosecuting attorneys, judges police department, all sorts of places. And he writes about me and his other victims. And, you know, I just never need to see it. That's kind of where I've come from. So time would go on and he would just continue to, you know, walk the edges of the restraining order, sending these letters, you know, not leaving the grocery store if I walked in there, even though I had a protection order. And it was really frustrating because I didn't want to necessarily start filing reports again because during the court hearings for that first case, it was found out that me involving the legal system or police officers made him think that it was a sign of my love for him. So I now was in this position of if I involve law enforcement or made these um, or, you know, bring in my evidence, if he gets arrested, he thinks I'm in love with him. So it was very confusing. So time went on and it just greatly affected my business because the last place you want to do if you're being stalked is be where they know you are. So I was closing all the time. I was really distracted. It was really hard to make a sale because my eyes are always out the window. Um, I was scared for my safety. I was scared for the safety of the people who came and shop there. I would end up each gallery walk having somebody with a concealed carry permit outside because I just knew that like it's one thing if something happened to me, but it's different if it happens to a larger group of people. So eventually in 2013, I would close down my business and I tried to stay in the community, but it was just too challenging as the years went on. Like he just 
my world shrank and shrank and shrank. Like leaving my apartment was scary. No matter what I did, like it just, you know, he just kept coming at it. And um, even though I had no physical address, like he would post images of where my house was, things like that. So it just felt like <clears throat> he was really closing in on me. And um, so eventually I would move across the country to Vermont to find safety and thought I would just disappear here. But then one day he started messaging me again and I never put the community I lived in um, online when I moved. But so when he started messaging me again, it was just very violent, very vulgar. Um, he was talking about how he felt he needed to kill law enforcement. He was talking about, you know, the very graphic ways in which I should die, all of these things. And he is very intelligent. He's like used the same words over the years. Like that letter in 2013, he started calling me evil. And it's like a theme he's continued to this day. Like he under, he brings these words along with him. So this is continuing. I'm here in Vermont, but I'm starting filing all the paperwork out in Washington. And they, have, the first prosecuting attorney decided not to build a case because I'm here in Vermont. And he's like, oh, she's safe. She's fine. Um, and eventually Jeffrey would get to the place where he said, I'm going to come to Waitsfield, Vermont to be with you. And that's where I live. And so how he ever figured that out, I don't know. But that was when it was just such an alarming thing. It's like, this guy is going to come here. Like, I'm not going to make it out of this alive. And it was a really, really dark time. I didn't really know anybody here. It was a very depressing time. Um, and new prosecuting attorney came on the case and he decided to go ahead and prosecute it. And during that time, Jeffrey was incarcerated on other stalking charges from his other victims. And it took us two years to build that case. Um, but we went to trial in 2019 and I had incredible support in the form of advocates preparing me for trial, incredible victim centered prosecuting attorneys. Um, even the judge would end up being very victim centered. Jeffrey would end up defending himself during the trial which means that he got to cross-examine me and was able to object. So I sat and testified for a day and a half with my stalker staring at me, objecting to me every single time I opened my mouth. And I don't know, I just channeled every bit of anger I've ever had in my life into that moment. and was just laser focused. And, um, and when he was actually cross-examining me, I would begin to realize that he'd actually been watching me since 2008 or 2009. Um, which I'll be honest, you do not want to find that information out from the person who's been doing it while you're testifying. It was horrific. But through all of that, we actually got um, aggravated felony stalking conviction and felony cyber stalking conviction. And I wrote a damn good bit, uh, victim impact statement and luckily had all of these victim center people like I've never hired a lawyer. This has all been people in the state doing what they should do. And he received the 10 years in prison, which at the time, which was the maximum. And at the time, that was one of the longest sentences in our country's history. And um, I remember the very first person I texted was actually Debbie, who was the first speaker on here today, just because the work that she did and, um, you know, us trying to raise awareness is really going to start to make that happen for other people. And so that, you know, especially we know that was stalking. 85% of people know the person that's stalking them. And a little, so much of that is coming from former relationships, intimate partners. And we have to be able to, to be these leaders so that these people can get safety as well. Um, it shouldn't just be the ones that get attraction from that stranger stalking. So that's my story. That was a very quick version of it. But there you go. Anna, thank you. I always tell you, I honor you in this moment. You was the first person that I really talked to about stalking that I heard you speak and I learned so much about you and just learning the process and what you had to endure for so many years. And so to get 10 years, I was celebrating with you. Like I'm still, every time you say it, I'm like, yes, you got some justice. You can't get your life back. It's still probably not enough, right? Cause he does so much to you, but it's something. And so I think it gives hope for people to be persistent and not to give up that there is a system in place that's supposed to work. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work. From your perspective, what worked well in your community with your prosecutor, your police department? What went right? Because we see it go wrong so many times. You know, I mean, I think that one thing, 
it was a very small community. So very small law enforcement. I was a person, I was a public figure in my community. So I was known and I went in there and said, I'm being stalked by a stranger. Now, if any of those things had changed, if I was a different gender, um, a different economic class, um, if I had dated him, if any of those things were different, I don't know that I'd be sitting here today. So I think that like, and it is a very caring community as well. So I really think that it was me meeting the exact right police officer, Officer Bill Corrigan, at the right time. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of kept things going. Um, and I pushed hard for it. I was just like, I'm not giving up. Like, here's my reports. Here's my reports. Um, so it just really feels like, and I know like it's the, some of us have all talked about, like, in some ways it was the perfect case of just every single person. I mean, there are tons of people that have come in and helped me over the years to get to that point. And even down to the right judge overseeing that trial, because it was a bench trial. And so I think even having this judge who, when Jeffrey was, you know, trying to, you know, object to me and stuff like that, even the judge said, this is not a time to victimize the witness. So even a judge using that language was really huge to me. I think we need to see when it goes right. So when we're advocating for others, when we're experiencing it, we can see what right looks like. And no, you need to do more for me. You need to do more for me in my community. From all of you, what do you think law enforcement, lawmakers, politicians, what is one thing that you think that they can do to help someone like you? Believe us, start Believe. by believing. Um, I think is the bigger one. Don't dismiss it. It's a crime that gets dismissed. We're told we're overreacting, all of these different things. So don't dismiss it. Okay. Love it. And I guess on that note, one of the things that I push for is law enforcement training. Um, go to the trainings. I mean, I have been all over the United States um, and I have seen an awful lot of good work in law enforcement, but I also see failure in law enforcement. And oftentimes those agencies are the ones who are saying that we don't need the training. Um, you do. I, I want to build off of what Anna and Debbie said too. Like I'm trying to create a stalking task force here in LA. So not only is it the believing and the training, but I also want to see funding for forensic psychologists on staff, because even if you have the training, you don't have the correct risk assessment tools. And I'm sorry, but there's bullshit like Mosaic, which is this computer program. You, don't, you barely listen. You type some stuff in and you're like, oh, you're going to be fine. It's not acceptable. You really need people who can, for example, just like forensic psychology wise, my, the forensic psychologist who evaluated my case, even the language is able to say like you are more at risk because he doesn't speak about you like a person. You are an object. Right. And like you can't you can't expect them to have that level of training. So we need we need funding to go to these additional people as well. Okay. And up level with your education and technology. Again, I'm in a major tech hub in Seattle. And one of my officers replied back when I gave him an IP address. What's an IP? And had no idea when I was explaining it. So how are you going to solve a crime and cyber crime if you don't understand the fundamentals of hyperspace? Mm -hmm. Um, I think in addition to the education, there has to be, a, they have to care, right? They have to be, they have to be intentional about being concerned about this. I don't think it's always rooted in ignorance. There's a million cases like Debbie's where someone has came forward and they said, we can't do anything about it. And then later that person ended up being dead and I'm sure it was brought back to their attention. This is the person you said you couldn't help. So the, it's, it's not always rooted in ignorance. It's rooted in them trying to compare what we're talking about to other violent crimes and saying that's not on my priority list because there's people that's actually being attacked. So law enforcement have been rooted more in being reactive, right? They go to places after things have been happened. So now when you come up with a crime that requires you to be preventive, they don't care. So I think um, they can have all the training in the world, but if I don't care to fight something, I'm not going to do it. I love that. You know, and I'll tell you all this because I'm very transparent and I do believe that we have good law enforcement. We have good politicians, prosecutors. We have them, but there are some that's not doing their job and there's some that are guilty of this. So I have two girlfriends who have told me that they were dating police officers and they started stalking them. Police officers are known for stalking. Right. So you have to be careful that we're not even reporting to somebody that's actually doing the act. Right because it's about power and control. We see a lot of power and control, and that's one field that they have a lot of power and control. They could roll up and see who's parked outside of your house and run a license plate. 
And so it's very important that you get the right person there to support you and that you don't give up and that you ask the right questions. For you all, what are some signs that there's a problem, right? Because I know Obi said he didn't even realize he was being stalked. And I will tell you, a lot of us don't, right? Especially when you just think they like you. Oh, they just like me. That it goes way past that they like me. They won't stop. What are some signs that people can look for? Um, if I can start with this one, I think one of the biggest signs is when a person disregards what you desire for yourself and they prioritize what they desire from you. I think it's a huge sign. When you notice a person is most of their day is occupied with thoughts of you. When you start seeing stuff like it was nice seeing you today and you didn't see the person, someone saw you when you start seeing things like that. So there's there's telltale signs that a person has pretty much made you a priority in their life. They've created a relationship psychologically with you. And now they're, they feel like they have an entitlement, an obligation to you, and they're expecting you to fulfill that role. And when you don't, they literally feel like they're being wronged. They don't feel like they're wronging you. They feel like they're being wronged because you're not satisfying a relationship they created in their mind. And when they feel like you're depriving them of what they're entitled to, um, measures become extremely desperate. So I think we need to we need to be able to recognize when somebody is is is, is just overindulged in us. Not take it as flattery, but take it as a threat. Um, I think those are the, some of the telltale signs. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? And I can just build off of that when we talk about the definition of stalking. It's this unwanted contact. You have repeatedly said stop or no or have disregarded this person or disregarded the contact that they are trying to make and they don't they don't stop. So we always have to think about that. It's that unwanted contact. And it's that gut. Um, I had that gut feeling um, when Patrick walked into our family home unannounced. Um, I had no idea how he found out my mother's address. Um, what was he doing there? But my gut instinct, the first time I saw him was not good. So oftentimes when I speak, I will say, trust your gut. If something isn't right, it, it's probably not right. That's great advice. Intuition is powerful. And a lot of times we just ignore it and brush it off. Dr. Juanita said the same thing. It happens to her and she brushes it off. So we have someone, Miss Regina, and I'll put her comment up so that you can all see it. She said, this is amazing. I have someone stalking me now. They are using a, a burner phone, but they use the name of people who I know in the community. I have reported this, but I don't see a sense of urgency. Nobody has called me in to show the messages. The person said his group has seven people paid to track me because they want to know me in case I decide to run for office. This is nerve wracking. Thank you, Regina, for sharing with us. And I just wanted to know, do y'all have some maybe insight or a perspective for Regina and maybe some things that she can do? Anna, go for it. This was the same situation <laughs> I was in and you slapped me with a ton of advice. I'm muting your <laughs> turn. Um, so one of the things, and I mean, Lenora, please tag it on this too. Um, first of all, I'm so sorry that's happening to you, Ms. Regina. And one of the things that I always advise people is to go to your local advocacy center before reporting to police and get an advocate. All too often we look at domestic and sexual violence centers and we don't think that they'll serve victims of stalking, but they are able to, um, if hopefully if they've had training. And so that's something I think is really important is to have somebody, because we don't know what state you're in or community or your laws. So if you can go there and start to see what assistance there is available and have them help you document things and put together something that you can take to law enforcement, I think is a good place to start. Lenore, do you want to tag on to that? No, I mean, that's that's absolutely right. Um, I would I would literally echo everything you said. Also, just like one thing I always just put out there because that's like that's that's part of it. But also, you're going to go through so much emotionally, right? It's also important to really build up your support system. And when I say that, it's great if we have loved one in our lives, but, you know, they may be well-intentioned and not fully understand and sometimes give bad advice. So seek out survivor community as well. I mean, that's just really instrumental in sharing stories and, and sort of getting, because a lot of times also, we don't even know how scary our situation is until sometimes we hear someone else and you're like, oh, wow, that's starting to mimic what's happening to me. So definitely, um, you know, it's great that you're here because you're doing exactly that, right? You're engaging with community. But I just always throw that in because I think it's so important. And, and knowing you're not alone, 
So asking that advice from others and, and coming for and Regina, she actually lives um, in South Carolina. So understanding the laws and the laws are so different in every state. And sometimes that frustrates me too, is that we can't help people nationally because every state has their own world rules, laws, regulations, their policies, they're all different. And so we have to understand that from our own foxhole. And Mr. Gina, I will gladly help you because I'm also in South Carolina and just so that we can understand the laws and come up with a system. So part of the things that we heard them say was copyright your picture. Now, Danny, I didn't think about that, but that is phenomenal. So maybe because you're going to run for office that you consider copyright your picture so that we can actually do something about it. I love that. Actually documenting everything that they're doing and doing a timeline. So I heard Danny say he had a timeline. Obi said the documentation on a document. They all are doc documenting what is happening to them. And to not take it lightly, it is serious. It can be fearful. And if you have fear, that's going up under the definition of stalking. And so thank you for being so transparent. And I honor you. And I promise that I will try to do what I can to connect you with different resources. And let's see if we can get you some assistance. So thank you for coming forward. Because we know that statistics say that people are three times more likely to die if they are being stalked, right? That's pretty high. It's stalking. So if there is domestic violence, if it's human trafficking, whatever it is, and, you, and stalking is involved, the risk of dying is so much greater. So we can't blow it off. We have to take it serious. If your friends or your family members are going through this, you got to tell them, we got to report this. Let's start documenting this and start protecting yourself because that's very important. Regina said she would have brushed it off until it kept happening. And I totally agree. And her daughter just said that we know they are watching this right now. They probably are watching this. And I hope people that are watching it realize that it's serious and it is a crime. And like Anna said, you can go to jail. She got 10 years. So we're fighting back, right? <laughs> just not taking this lightly. This is serious. And we're trying to inform people so that they know exactly what's going on and how to protect yourselves and not to just blow it off. Right. Jennifer said, I echo connecting with the nearest victim service organization to provide support and advocacy. Yeah, they do. And people don't realize that that's one of the things that we do as advocates. It's help from a stalking perspective as well. So, and it's different in every state. So no matter where you are, make sure you understand the laws. I don't care if it's domestic violence, if it's incest, get the laws and know your rights in your state. Right. I just had to tell somebody about some laws as relates to domestic violence and stalking definitely occurs in domestic violence. You saw that with Debbie's sister. And so don't take it lightly. We have to really protect ourselves. So I want to know from you all, what are some things that people say to you that is offensive? Right. That aggravates you, that could come off as rude, but they think they're saying good things to you. Sometimes they think they're not. I want to know what can we say as a community? to somebody that is going through this or who is a survivor? Danny, you smile. <laughs> I said to you. I, know, I just had this happen yesterday. Isn't that so funny? Uh, and it happens so frequently that someone somewhere well-intentioned, somebody close will say something like, um, it really wasn't that big of a deal. At least it wasn't a real crime. You know, I hear that all the time and that's such a dumb answer and and one of my recommendations is if you're going through it to trust your gut build your community of support but set boundaries while you do it and i cut those people out when i was going through it because they were not healthy for me and and now i have a toggle I'll turn them off even now um because it is uh, my, my judge judge robert lasnick federal judge when he sentenced joel he said, it doesn't matter if it's a knife or a gun to the head or an iPhone, crime is crime and you'll do the time. It's a serious business, serious crime. Kudos to your judge. I like mm -hmm. when you all mention the police officer, the judges, the prosecutors. I think it's important for people to know the good ones, right? All right. Anyone else? What are some things yeah. that people have said to you? In addition to what Dane was talking about, I think people need to acknowledge that stalking is more than just somebody calling your phone a lot. We have five people on the line and everybody has lost something. Anna lost an art gallery. Lenora lost an art gallery. Danny lost a job. Debbie lost a sister. And I lost opportunities. There's nobody on this line that hasn't lost something. And everybody on this line still feels like 
their stalker is omnipresent. Anna's got 10 years, but when those 10 years elapse, she'll still be alive. I'm sure that's in the back of her mind. The only person that's not worried about it no more isn't alive. So people have to sincerely acknowledge that this is a real crime and it's not just somebody who's contacting you a lot. Yeah, I also want to include the collateral damage, right? Like we've talked about as far as work and everything, but like, do you know what it's like to go on a date and people, like they Google you or whatever they find it and you have to sit down and be like, yeah, I like you, but this guy's been trying to kill me for a decade. I hope he doesn't like, you know, it's like that, that kind of stuff, right? What it does to our friendships and our family who are constantly under stress and worried about us. So there's just collateral damage. It really sort of infiltrates every aspect of our life. And the other thing I just want to think, because I feel like I've, I've talked way too much, is that, you know, when people say, oh, it's not like a crime, right? Because if the violent event hasn't happened yet, a lot of us are multi-trauma survivors. I've already been raped. So when I get rape threats, you know, what that does, like, right? So we have to really be careful with our language when speaking to people. And I know people are trying to say that, not because they're trying to minimize or trying to make me feel better in some weird way. They just don't know how to articulate it properly. So just know you never know somebody's history and you don't know if this particular threat is really triggering for them. Or maybe like me, I, I had a very close friend who was murdered by a stalker, right? I mean, not everybody knows that. So just to remember that as well. I'm going to kind of tap. I agree with everything that everyone else is saying. And then we'll just kind of speak to that collateral damage as well as like, yeah, even though this guy's in prison, he's going to get out. Like this isn't a crime that stops. He's still writing all of those letters. Like, I'm still dealing with, I have safety and I'm so lucky, right? But it's still in the back of my head and just that psychological toll. Um, yeah, of just, you know, trying to get employment, trying to date, trying to rent an apartment. Um, all of those things are more difficult if you're an ongoing victim of crime. Um, and I think one thing like that I always think is really important is our language. You know, we hear people say all the time, oh, I was stalking him on Instagram or you run into somebody a couple times in a day. Oh, were you stalking me? Like when we can start to shift that away and take that away from that romantic context is really important to acknowledging what a serious crime this is. It's not a joke. It's not yeah. funny at all. It's not funny. Debbie, what about you? What are some things that people have said to you? Oh, where does the list <laughs> start and end? Um, I, I would say uh, what uh, um, Anna had just said about the language, you know, I'm stalking you in the library. Um, I, I, I cringe. I cringe when I hear people say that. I cringe when it's written in an email, um, you know, like, oh, hey, I was I was stalking you while you were out hiking the other day. Like the, the use of that minimizes the crime of stalking. Um, and also, I guess it's nothing that was never said to me, but it was something that we've used in a presentation. It was a, a T-shirt that was targeted to, I think, like tween girls. And um, it was very sparkly. And it said it had something to do with equating stalking and love. So we're sending this message to these young girls. Um, you know, some call it love. I call it stalking. We're sending this message to these young girls that if you are stalked, you are loved. Um, and I've spoken in high schools where these girls are like, no, no, you want him to call you 20 times. You want him to check in on you. So this, this mindset is happening to, you know, younger and younger. So it does, it goes back to language and the use of stalking, because when you have people that are experiencing stalking, and then we have the use of how we use the language and these sparkly t-shirts out there in that victim's mind is, well, how could it be a crime? Should I even tell anybody about this? Because society makes light of it. So um, yeah, I struggle with that. And yes, it does make me angry. I can see that. For me, I always tell people to say things like, how can I help you? What do you need from me? And it doesn't matter what trauma that is. That applies to all trauma, all things that people are going through. They don't always need your advice. They want to know what want you to say, what can I do for you? So they may need, might need you to go with them to the police department. They might just want you to sit there with them. They want to know how can, you know, you support them. And they may say, I'm fine. I don't need anything. But that's probably all you should say because people don't want to hear all the extra comments, right? They don't want your opinions. Well, if I was you, I would do this. Well, you're not me. You don't know what I'm going through. So don't say that. Try to just 
have a better conversation with individuals who are struggling. And this is serious. This is not something that you could take lightly. Dr. Juanita McDonald had a comment. She said, the degree of what each of you lost is what I focused on earlier. To what degree do you shut yourself off from loved ones and resources? Any one of you can answer. Um, I'll, I'll regurgitate the question to make sure I understand what she's asking. She's saying, at what degree do we detach ourselves mm -hmm. from? From love, other people resources well for me there was a there was a period of self-blame right where i had to ask myself what did i do to contribute to this situation and what could i have do and, and, and in doing that it seems like i automatically issued a person stalking me a certain level of reprieve because i'm saying that i did something so it made me feel like um when you meet a person you never know that these individuals have these tendencies Right. So there's no way to look at the person initially and say, OK, this person has a red light on their forehead that lets me know they're going to do this thing. You just have to take a chance and hope that it doesn't happen. So it made me feel like um, like I, I just wasn't motivated to create any new relationships with anyone who I didn't know. Um, as far as family, that comes to when people try to um, minimize try to minimize the significance of it, right? And, and that level of insensitivity makes you just not want to deal with that person. So it makes you reluctant to meet new people because you don't know what anybody's capable of. And then people who try to minimize it, it makes you want to detach from those individuals as well because clearly um, they don't have, I guess, the, the intelligence or the regard in order to care about what you're going through. So I hope I addressed your question to some extent. You did. Thank you. Anybody else? I'll just I'll chime in from my what I saw happen to my sister about how um, so detached she became from everything. And I know, uh, especially with her family, I mean, we, we have a really, really close, good family. And for her, being present in our life, she felt like she was putting us in harm's way. And that was something that was very, very difficult. Um, you know, she had three young nieces that adored her. And for her, the struggle was, I want to be with them, but I don't want to put these little girls in danger. So um, that was really, really hard, um, hard decision making for her. And um, she struggled with it a lot. But, you know, at the end of the day, she was trying to keep herself alive. Thank you. I would echo that as well. Uh, I think one of the things that my stalker did as well was uh, involved two of my closest friends who are watching now. I'm glad they're here. Also, my family. And and with that being said, too, you all know my past, right? I'm a, I've been through conversion therapy. So my, my relationship with my family is already kind of on the rocks. We've, we've repaired and rebuilt in some marvelous ways. But there is a point where it became unhealthy to continue that relationship and I had to put up boundaries and that's okay too, right? To trust yourself, know yourself, build the community that's gonna support you and lift you up through this as well. Boundaries are important. Yeah, and just to add that, my dad was my best friend and when he was dying in 2013, it was in the pretty early stages of what was happening to me and I did not disclose the severity of what was going on because I didn't want his last thoughts to be that he was leaving this planet and I was not okay. So I have to carry with me the rest of my life, the, the closeness and the, the love that my father and I had that I just, there was one thing in my life that I didn't talk to him about, you know? So that stuff is, is really carry like heavy and we carry it with us. Yeah, I'll, um, you know, I mean, it has definitely put strain on my family over the years for sure. Um, I think that there's, you know, this one thing of like people don't, ever quite understand this a lot of times. So a couple of years ago, one of my best friends called me up. She had a situation where a woman was kind of stalking her for a couple of weeks. And my friend called me up and she's like, I'm so sorry. I never understood until now what you've gone through. Like, I just, I can't even imagine. Um, and so, you know, that's hard to like be able to describe it. And, you know, similar to Lenore, my father passed away a couple of years ago and it was during that time of him, dying it was a short time period of about nine weeks i went to be with my family in ohio and take care of him and it was during that time that i actually realized that because suddenly i could walk the trails of my parents house i could go to the grocery store without fear all of these things that had been removed i could do again and it was through the passing of my father that i realized that if i ever wanted safety i was going to have to leave washington 
So there's the distance and there's the closeness as well. For you that are single, does it affect your dating? Like, are you dating? Or is it like, ah? Absolutely. Everybody crazy. (laughs) This is what it feels like because especially with the evolution of social media. And then to go back to the previous question, when how do we cut ties with people? We sort of had this thing where we abandoned some of the ways that are innate to us as well. We abandoned um, the ways we take care of our business. With the evolution of social media, promotion is through social media. There were people who would hire me for speaking engagements and I would tell them, yes, I can do it, but I can't share the flyer because right now I'm dealing with this and I don't want this type of chaos to come towards. So there, it, was, it was hurting business. But as far as people, if someone can say something like me, like, I notice you're going to be in North Carolina on such and such date. And it'll raise a red flag. This is a flyer that I've shared. So I, it, it's clear that you, but just hearing somebody say, I notice you're going to be, is like, what? So it, it makes you skeptical of everything. Things that, that are done in innocence, they look like red flags now. So um, it absolutely affects trust. It affects your ability to, to let people in. <laughs> Yeah, I would say like it definitely affects an ability to date. Um, one, because of the work I do, it terrifies a lot of men. Um, I have fun as heterosexuals. So I honestly, will, if someone asks me out, I give them my business card and say, go through my entire website and let me know if you still want to go out with me. Just because I'm like, I don't feel like dealing with this. Um, but I have had men that I've been dating. And once I, this is, you know, before I started my business and was public about this, once I disclosed that we're like, I can't date you. You're a danger. Like, what if he comes here? He's he might harm me as well. And so, so yeah, it's definitely very much affect those areas of my life. Yeah, I can see that. I love it. Honestly, I it, I'm on the other side of it. So when you Google me, you'll see that I put somebody in prison for stalking me and not respecting my boundaries. And now I'm coming back and saying, if you're going to date me, if we're going to go on, the, if you're going to ride this train, <laughs> you're going to respect my boundaries. And if you don't, there's going to be consequences. And that's sound mental health right there. Oh, it definitely weeds out a lot of people like the pickings <laughs> are slim, but that's OK. I'd rather it be that way. <laughs> Yeah, I was kind of in the middle with it. When um, my husband, who's like an amazing guy, apparently we were, we were friends. He had a crush on me for years and he never came forward and told me because he knew this all happened. I mean, the last thing he wanted to be was just some creepy dude or make me feel threatened. So he just held on to that crush for years. Right. And then when he finally told me we started dating, like literally three weeks into it, I like looked at him and I said, I am up to my neck in male bullshit. If you do anything, I will ruin your life. And he 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 decided to move forward and he's been he's been nothing but wonderful ever since. So it, you know, it's it's both, but I I think even sometimes there's yeah, there's there's the nice got nice people like that who are just like, "Oh, I don't, you know, they've been through so much. I don't want to potentially, you know, scare them too." So it's it's complicated, but uh, that's why my wedding, I was so celebratory with it because I wanted to show survivors you can find love. You can find that, you know. Thank you. That is very special. That is very special. And I'm happy that you did find love and that you're married now. You know, that, that, and that's kind of scary too, because then you start worrying about who's going to do something to your husband. So I could see that fear. So I love that. Um, Regina said, this is why I have slowed down. My fear is that someone will get close to me and douse me with acid or something like this. I only feel safe when I'm with my daughter or a few men in the neighborhood. So, yeah, it, it does affect your relationships and dating and trusting people. And we do have to get on top of this one, Regina, because you shouldn't have fear, right? You all, and you've all experienced fear, and we don't want that to be the way that we live, right? So, I do want just one word of advice that you would give anybody, just for your advice, your last words before we get out of here today. Oh, there's a lot, but honestly, Get yourself an advocate. Please find someone in your neighborhood, jurisdiction, city, college, campus. Find someone to talk with. Get an advocate by your side before you head into this realm of reporting your stalking case because they can be a an amazing support system. It's something that I wish my sister would have had. I would yeah, say, so, if, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, if, um, if someone comes to you and says that they're being stalked, take them seriously. Don't diminish it. Take them seriously. Believe them. Point them towards advocates. Just be there to support them. Um, but as always, like, start by believing. Start by 
I believe. Yeah. Lenora. Uh, something that Obi said really got me thinking about a lot of people that come to me and it's, you know, they're very hard on themselves. I dated this person. I brought this friend. And what I say to them is life is hard enough. Do not make it harder on yourself. Like just show yourself some kindness and some grace and love. And also with that being said, every survivor has a different journey, right? Some of us are afraid of police. Some of us love police. Like what everybody has to do to get to where they have to go and to try and just listen in a place of non-judgment is really important. Because there's sometimes when people say things, you're like, why do you think, you know, and it dry because you're coming from a different place. And it's just to understand we're all so different. Our stories are so different and we don't all have the same way that we go about things. I love that. I want, I want to share too, mental health, let's normalize it. If you can, if you have the resources to get a therapist, one that you trust, it has been such a lifesaver for me throughout this whole journey and getting my mental health in check was critical. So I'm going to pay that forward. I love that. Um, along with what Danny said, as it pertains to mental health, you heard a lot of people on this panel today say that the person that was stalking them had mental health issues. So just like Lenora said, she, we're not saying that people with mental health are dangerous, but on the flip side, don't allow mental health to be a reason to justify somebody's mistreatment towards you. So if you are connected to somebody who's dealing with this, just um, understand you are the first line of defense and how you respond to what they tell you might determine whether or not they go forward and get help. If you discount it and call them crazy, they might stop there and just deal with it. So in order for them to go forward, you have to be supportive. So if you are that friend, you're going to be the first line of defense. And how you respond to them is going to determine whether or not they go to that next layer of defense. So be cognizant of that when you're responding to people. I think that's important. And our organization, Hush No More, we provide free counseling. So if you don't have insurance, if it doesn't matter where you live, we try to find you free counseling because it's important to tap your mental health for you as well, right? And for your family members. So reach out to us at hushnomore.org. And you can call us also at 1-888-285-2161 and contact us to inquire about free counseling because mental health is important, not just for your stalker, but for you as well. I am truly honored to be here with all of you today. Unfortunately, you are subject matter experts because of your experiences, but also because you are difference makers in your community. You are raising awareness. You have decided to hush no more. I honor all of you in this moment because you are giving a piece of yourself to help somebody else, to help another child, a team, another family member. And I thank you so very much for joining us today. And you can all reach out to them. You have seen their information, their emails, their websites, their IG handles, handles. contact them, reach out to them. I love everything that they do. You could follow the work that they do and you can invite them to your organization churches, youth groups, you need to talk about this, different colleges, they will come out and talk to the community about what they do and about the knowledge that they have to inform those who are with you. So please remember that, okay? You have words in the chat one where everybody's saying thank you. Thank you, Jake, thank you. It really was incredible and I'm honored to be able to be your host. My name is Dr. Vanessa Dunn-Guyton and if you need any services as it relates to any of the Hush topics, we are here for you. And remember that January is Stalking Awareness Month. And what's coming up next is April. April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And so we all will have a lot of activities going on. We'll be out speaking because a lot of times stalking is a precursor to sexual assault. So you won't hear um, a lot about this in a couple of the months, but you can see it coming out a lot in April. So follow us. We're trying to make noise. And you don't have to talk about stalking in the month of January. Talk about it every month because we need to know this and it affects us all. It doesn't matter about your race, your gender, your sexuality. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're poor, if you're rich, it affects us all. So peace and blessings to you. I hope you have an amazing day and share this video because so many people need to know how to handle stalking awareness. And I think we did an amazing job. So please share it in our community. Thank you all. Peace. Vanessa, can I say one last thing? Yes, you can. One last thing. I hate to add this after the closing, but do not discount your situation because it's not as severe as the situations you heard on here. If it's not as severe as Lenora, it's not as severe as that, that doesn't mean that it's not happening. Any level of this needs to be addressed. So don't discount your situation. That's all. I swear I'm done. Don't discount it. Does anybody else have anything? Like we say in church, all minds clear? All right. All minds are clear. Thank you all. It was a great show.